Hello A-pushers! Um, greetings from after spring break. Um, so here we are going to have our lecture notes on the Roaring Twenties. So um, buckle up for what we're all going to talk about. We're going to have a lot of things going on. Some things should be familiar from things that you've read and covered in English class. So you might see some things on here again that are a bit more familiar, but uh, definitely make sure you're reading that chapter in your AMSCO book because we're going to be covering a lot of topics. So we have here our title screen. It said it's the era of prosperity, uh, Republican power, and conflict. So you got a lot of dynamic things happening during this time period. So let's start off with what happened to get us here. So right before this time period, obviously, is World War I, right? And we have this quote here from another AP history textbook, right? That the war's unimaginable carnage produced a post-war disillusionment among young intellectuals that changed old values and purred a new modernist sensibility among artists, writers, and intellectuals. This is basically a definition here for the lost generation, right? So this lost generation is they are intellectually lost. Um, they've seen World War I, they've seen the carnage that it ha that uh, took place, and they are so wanting to escape from that horrible thing that's happened in their lives that they now want to basically have fun all the time and distract themselves from all those horrible things that they have seen. Um, and so from this uh, distraction is where we're going to have all of this prosperity, spending, um, just all the craziness that happens in the 1920s that a lot of us have seen in movies like The Great Gatsby, right? By the way, that would be a great movie to watch um, while you are looking over stuff from the 1920s. Um, so again, this uh, whole time period, we can kind of see this big reflection or reaction from the First World War, right? So this time period is also called the Jazz Age because that's when we're going to have a lot of jazz music. It's going to be coming into uh, modern American culture. Again, a reaction to the First World War. And we are also seeing from our census at the time, which by the way, this is census time right now in 2020. So definitely make sure your parents have filled out the census um, so we can make sure we get all of that federal funding coming to our current area. Um, but at this particular time in the 1920s on our our little chart here. We're going to look at the yellow part of our chart. So we're seeing more and more people, all right, once we get all the way here to the 1920s, right, that are going to be moving from rural areas to urban areas, right, and then we see that continue on into the 1990s, right. So this is kind of like the, you know, kind of this big section of this upward chart of momentum. Um, and again, more people are moving to the cities, less people working on farms, and so we're going to see that things are not as prosperous for our farmers. Right. Some of the things we usually think of with the 1920s in prosperity is Henry Ford and the Ford assembly line. All right, now Henry Ford, this guy right here, he is not the inv uh, inventor of the assembly line. What he does though is he adds conveyor belts to this assembly line. So if we look up at this picture right here, right, these guys do not have to move from their station. They can, uh, the cars will move to them. So it's more efficient. Um, again, mass production is happening, um, and this is considered the age of the automobile. Um, so Henry Ford is going to be making the Model T, um, and there's a joke with this, is that the reason he's making them so cheap is that you could get them in any color you wanted as long as it was black. Um, so not a lot of different features you could pick out for your cars at the time, um, but again, this is going to keep them very, very cheap. Um, the time period they would be sold for $500. Um, I do not have an inflation calculator with me right now, um, so I don't know what that would be in modern money, but still way, way cheaper than what we're paying for cars today, right? So lots of things going on that are uh, creating the economy to expand. However, agriculture is not doing so well. So let's spend a little bit of time with agriculture, right? To kind of go back in time, think back to the Gilded Age and the, um, the populist movement with the farmers, right? And how those people wanted to have all this change. They wanted the reg uh, re to regulate the railroads. They wanted um, to have term limits on um, the president. They wanted to have term limits on all these other politicians. They wanted the federal government to help them out. Um, and they're going to be running for office in uh, those late uh, 1800s elections. Um, however, we're going to see that they don't get a lot of these things during the progressive era. They get some, but not all the things that they want. Um, and unfortunately, people aren't going to be paying attention to them very much again, right? 
Um, so we have this agricultural depression that's happening because everyone's moving to the cities, right? We got our little chart over here that's really nice. Um, so it has the end of World War I, right? Remember, we were creating lots and lots of grains and food for to be shipped over to Europe to help out. Well, since that demand is not there anymore, this is going to continue to go down, all right, as far as our production is going, all right? We are going to be more efficient in how we're creating all of our crops because we got all these cool new machines. However, buying these machines are extremely expensive, and so once people aren't buying your produce anymore, your crops, you're not going to have money to pay off those machines, so you're going to be in debt that way. And if um, then if you can't pay back all of your debts, then uh, the bank is going to come after you, take your machines, and then also take your farm. Um, because that is your business that you put up as collateral. Um, however, once you take the farm, that's also where those people live. So we're seeing lots of um, repossession of people's farms. Um, the depression is going to hit the farmers in the 1920s, and they were kind of like uh, what we could consider, quote, the canary in the coal mine, right? And what we mean by the canary in the coal mine is that f coal miners used to take canaries down into the mines with them to make sure that they had enough oxygen. Once the canary would stop singing and then and die. Um, sorry if you can hear the thunder in the background. Um, but when the canary would die, that would tell the miners that they didn't have enough oxygen and they should leave the coal mine immediately. So they should always pay attention to the canary. Well, here, if we use that same saying, the canary in the coal mine is the farmers, that means we weren't paying attention to the farmers and they could have given us a warning. Right? Um, and that's kind of a trend you will see throughout U.S. history is that people really should pay attention to farmers. If the farmers are struggling, that means the rest of us will be struggling eventually. Right? Um, another thing to kind of bring in here that we've talked about before right, is that we know we have sharecropping in the South with African Americans. We're going to have a new uh, vocabulary term here, de facto slavery or de facto segregation. Um, when we say the word de facto, what that means is um, it's a Latin term for like s what is happening, the facts on the street, okay? Um, what's happening in society. So you're having slavery happen not by law, but in how people are interacting with each other, right? If it was uh, enforced by law, it would be called de jour, um, is the word that we would use, not de facto. Okay, so think like de jour, like J, like juries and judges, right? Um, from uh, Georgia studies, you might remember this little dude over here. This is the bull weevil, right? That's eating all those cotton crops. And this is going to cause all these people to be leaving the South, going to the North and to the West for new factory jobs because the, you know, there's not a lot uh, happening in the South as far as agricultural concerns are going, right? And that should have made you think of the Great Migration. And a lot of people are going to be moving all over the place. We saw this map before. Um, and one of those specific places is Harlem in New York City, right? And that's going to then lead us to da, 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 the Harlem Renaissance, right? So the Harlem Renaissance is going to be mostly focused on writing, literature, and art. You do see some jazz in this, but remember jazz actually comes from the New Orleans area from the South. Um, it's not that it's not going to be in Harlem, but Harlem's going to be more of our literature and art. Um, so Harlem Renaissance is not necessarily going to include a lot of music um, in this. Now, from uh, English classes, you should have talked about the Harlem Renaissance, right? If you have not, definitely read a little bit more in uh, your book about this particular section, right? Because we're going to go over kind of like the bigger highlights because, again, a lot of people have had this in classes already, right? So Langston Hughes, he is this guy right here. He's probably the name on this list that you have heard of the most, right? He is a poet, um, and he's kind of like the quintessential uh, poem poet of the Harlem Renaissance time period. One of his poems that we are going to kind of list here is going to be the uh, a dream deferred. So what he means by deferred is that you're not going to have it right now. So think of it as um, a lot of his stories are going to be about the struggle of African Americans um, and how they have these dreams, but they've been put aside. They've been deferred, if you will, um, to because of racism, because of the impacts of sharecropping, this legacy of slavery that's been happening. So they're trying to still get these dreams, but they have been put off to the side for many, many people for a long period of time, right? Um, Alan Locke, this guy right here, right? Okay, he is uh, going to write a book called The New Negro. And what he talks about in this book, all right, kind of again in brief for all of these, is 
going to be new jobs and new vocations that African Americans can take part of. So they're not just going to be farmers and sharecroppers all the time. They have all these other things that they can do. Um, and so again, this kind of rebirth, um, again, Renaissance means rebirth. So this rebirth in what occupations um, and careers and things like that, that African Americans can obtain, right? Zora Neale Hurston, this lady right over here, she is fairly famous. You might have heard of her if you have read some of her books. One of her most famous ones is Their Eyes Are Watching God. Um, it was actually made into a movie um, by, um, through Oprah's book club and everything. Um, so if you're interested and want to watch another movie to kind of uh, bring some of this historical things to life, all right, definitely I would recommend that. It's a very good movie. Um, so she kind of becomes sort of like a superstar uh, during this time period. Like she um, would go to jazz clubs and things like that and have to have um, kind of like a group of security around her. Um, so very uh, popular woman and uh, her books are actually very, very good. So if, again, you want something to read that kind of, um, you know, takes care of some of that boredom you might be having, I would definitely highly recommend that book. Um, it is very, very good. All right now, a shout out to our students who have taken AP Art History. Um, Jacob Lawrence is one of the people that they talk about in that particular class. He is a Harlem Renaissance painter, um, and he has all these uh, paintings. You can see definitely primary source colors are throughout all of his paintings. Um, there was a interview with him where people asked, like, "Oh, well, why did you pick these uh, these colors?" Like, trying to make it. Um, a really big deal and he was like well those are the only colors I had um, so that's why he picked those colors um, but here in the middle uh, this I think is one of my favorite uh, paintings of his it has people are all at a train station going to Chicago New York and st. Louis and this is to represent the Great Migration over here you have these girls they are at a chalkboard and they're writing numbers so it is like a math lesson um, you got people working uh, this looks like someone's doing some woodworking here um, people at a gathering um, and then this one here obviously the people are pretty scared and there's a dog over here so this one's obviously these people leaving um, a reason to leave the south and things like that so Jacob Lawrence is kind of this uh, he's this artist from this time period and you can definitely see this idea of um, abstract drawings through um, all of his paintings and so again kind of giving us a feel of like some of that abstract uh, kind of Picasso type of influence that's happening during this time period. Right. Our last thing for the Harlem Renaissance is we're going to look at a little bit here of Marcus Garvey. Right? So Marcus Garvey, right, he is going to be the uh, African American leader during the 20s. Okay, so if we you know continue to always have all of these African American leaders throughout time, we could kind of have a big timeline of them, right? And Marcus Garvey definitely would be in that 1920s era. Right? So he's going to create a group called the Universal Negro Improvement Association very similar to the NAACP that was created by W.E.B. Du Bois in 1909. Um, so kind of like, you know, just taking a different take on the very similar ideas, right? He believes in this new concept called Black Pride. So this idea of kind of going from that Harlem Renaissance, um, encouraging pride in your community and uh, your art, your literature, your music, stuff like that. Um, he is not going to get along with the boys, which is why he makes his own group, because he is an advocate for racial segregation. That is similar to Booker T. Washington. His belief is the same as Booker T. Washington, the idea that if you keep society separate, um, then you're not going to be influenced by those other societies and you can kind of, um, you can create all of your good things for your particular group and not lose them. Um, basically kind of trying to avoid the idea of assimilation into white society, right? Um, which again, Du Bois doesn't agree with this, right? But at the same time, it does make sense to like, you know, try to avoid that idea of um, assimilation and losing some of those key things of black society, okay? Um, he's also gonna have this black uh, back to Africa movement um, and he's gonna create a, a ship line called the Black Star Line for people to go back to Africa. 
Um, this is not super successful at the time. Um, he is criticized from this and he is actually going to be charged with fraud because he's going to take kind of take some of that money and uh, use that for his own purposes. You can kind of see this um, very elaborate outfit uh, going on here in this picture. Um, now, there is some controversy that some people at the time and historians nowadays think that maybe this was the government trying to silence him, all right, and then he would eventually be found guilty of fraud and deported back to his home of Jamaica. Um, I don't know enough about the background on this to give you a full version, but um, but that is a possibility, right? It's one of those things that this could have been um, a bit more information to like for the government to try and stop him and his movement, or they could have just been like, no, he was creating fraud and they deported him. Um, again, we'd have to look into a little bit more of our sources to find out a bit more information on that. Um, if you find one that you think is really good, definitely send me the link to an article or something like that so I can learn a little bit more. Um, but I do know that if you ever do go to Jamaica, um, Marcus Garvey is on most of their money. Um, so he is going to be very influential in the community when he goes back to Jamaica. All right now to move on to some of our politicians. Right. So um, during this time period of the 1920s, the Republican Party is going to be in power. All right. And we're going to start off with President Warren G. Harding. All right. Now, Warren G. Harding is when he gets elected in 1920, will have a campaign slogan, return to normalcy. All right. You could definitely make a parallel of return to normalcy to uh, Donald Trump's make America great again. Right. Because both of these have the same idea that people want to ignore um, and be distracted from current issues that they might have. Right. And go back to when times were good. Right. So for um, Warren G. Harding here, return to normalcy, he wants to go back to before World War One, when things were good. The economy was doing very well. So think back to the Gilded Age. Right. When people were making lots and lots of money. Right. If we compare this to Donald Trump's um, make America great again, we would then have it a throwback to the 1950s when times were really good, the economy was doing well, people were able to buy a lot of things, right? And um, things were just in general more affordable. Now, are these two time periods, the Gilded Age and the 1950s, good for everyone in the country? Of course not, right? The Gilded Age, we can say you have your workers are being mistreated, um, and you're having lots of inequality and racism in the United States. 1950s, this is the beginning of the civil rights movement. So that definitely tells us that things are not great for everyone. Um, but again, both of these uh, time periods, we can compare these two slogans, if you will, for people running uh, for president of this back to when times were good. Okay, so hopefully again, that makes sense. Um, definitely send me questions if you have them, all right? Um, the big thing for Harding is that he has uh, leaves office with lots of scandals, all right? We'll get to the Teapot Dome one in just a moment with a cartoon, all right? Um, the Ohio gang, because he is going to be from Ohio, is he basically put in uh, his cabinet all these people that were his uh, political affiliates back in Ohio, and he only trusted the people that he knew for a long period of time. Uh, he didn't add anybody new. So it was basically you're either in his in crowd or you're not. Um, so again, they kind of nicknamed it the Ohio gang because it was all these people that used to be his affiliates when he was in power um, in the state of Ohio. Okay. Um, he will die in office, right? Um, and his vice president, uh, President Coolidge, will then take over. All right, so let's get to this Teapot Dome scandal. All right, so the Teapot Dome scandal, all right, I wanted to bring up this cartoon here. Um, Teapot Dome is in Wyoming, all right? So that's the only thing that has anything to do with Teapot, all right? Um, so it is a location in Wyoming. And from our cartoon here, we're talking about oil. So basically what's going on, again, super short in a nutshell, is that um, there are people that uh, are selling off this oil land out in Wyoming that is um, owned by the national government and they're profiting off of it. Um, and so this is a scandal that is going to rock the White House. So again, this teapot dome is uh, taking this um, kind of bulldozer looking thing um, to the White House highway. Um, so again, it's just an example of corruption during the presidency of Harding. Right. Okay, so now we get on to Coolidge. All right, um, Coolidge is going to be just kind of continuing on the status quo of the Republican Party at the time, right? So he has a couple quotes from him, the business of America is business, right? So his whole thing is just to continue on making sure businesses are doing well, and as long as we're making money, 
He doesn't care about anything else. Well, look at the time period he's president. 1923 to 1929, right? The stock market crashes in October of 1929 when he is still president, right? And so the idea of a lot of the business ideas from this time period from Coolidge and from uh, Harding are going to create the depression because they're only concerned with business, they're not con concerned with anything else or the implications of what might happen because we're only concerned with business. Okay. So during this time period, we are going to have some immigration restrictions, right? These are left over from World War I, right? So we are scared of people from Eastern Europe, especially from Russia, because we are scared of communism. So the Red Scare is continuing, right? We're going to have quota acts. We're going to see some pictures, um, some cartoons of those quota acts, right? Uh, foreign policy, all right? We're going to have two things, the Kellogg Brand Pack and the Dawes Plan. Definitely read up on these two guys. These are a little bit of stuff you might have talked about in world history, but um, again, it might be something that we need a little bit more background on. So for the Kellogg Brand Pact, right, states uh, promise not to use war to, dis uh, to resolve disputes or conflicts, right? And when we say to mean countries. So basically, it's a promise that we're just not going to use war to uh, get rid of our problems. Um, yeah, that's not going to last super long. Right. Um, but again, it was something we tried to prevent war. Uh, the Dawes plan here is an attempt to follow uh, World War One um, and to co uh, collect reparations um, from Germany. OK, um, we're going to see a chart here in a little bit of the Dawes plan. It is not going to be a good idea. Um, it's going to just make this depression once it does hit, um, hit really, really hard. All right. Um, he's going to continue laissez-faire economics. Right. We've talked about that before. It's hands off economics. Um, and Coolidge is he, he was a farmer from Vermont at the time, right? Um, that's uh, where his family was from. And he has a quote, farmers ha uh, never made, uh, have never have made much money. Um, I do not believe we can do much about it. So basically, he's just kind of ignoring what uh, the issues are that we're going to see with uh, with those farmers. Um, and he was uh, definitely known um under his nickname as Silent Cow, right? So Calvin Coolidge, so silent, safe, and sure. Um, there's actually a funny uh, story that there was a um, a woman reporter that went to a White House dinner and she was given a bet that you can't make uh, Coolidge say more than two words. And so she goes and talks to him and tells him about this bet and everything like that. And his response to her was, you lose, which is only two words. Um, so maybe he did have somewhat of a sense of humor, even if he was quite quiet. Um, definitely, this is a good chart for the Dawes plan. Um, definitely put this into your notes to figure out what's going on, because the Dawes plan is a little weird. Um, and what I mean it's a little weird is that we're, we're trying to make people pay back these loans, the Germans pay back the loans and pay back all these reparations, but they don't have any money to do so. Um, so we have one U.S. loans to Germany. Uh, money to pay reparations. So we're going to be giving Germany money so that they can pay their reparations. Then the Germans pay back their allies, uh, pay back the allies and agree upon a lower rate, um, so a lower interest rate. And then the allies are going to be able to pay back the United States with money they got from Germany. So what this is called, right, because we're giving them money so then they can pay money to the England and France and then pay us money. Um, this is a thing called priming the pump. All right. And what this means is kind of like think of it as a giant rock is that you if you don't move the rock at all, it's going to be really hard to move. But once you start getting it moving, it's going to continue rolling down the hill. All right. OK, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to start, you know, having these businesses, um, creating money, creating jobs and that sort of thing. We're trying to get this roll, this rock moving. Um, but yes, we are paying money to these other people so that they we can get our money back. Right, but it's again trying to get that rock moving along the way. Right. Um, so some other things we got going on, all right, is um our League of Nations is not going well. We just had that started at the end of World War One. Um, here's your little bridge of the League of Nations. We are the keystone, and so it's not going to fill out very well. Um, over in Germany, they're having hyperinflation. Here's a picture of children playing with bricks of money. 
um, because it's literally not worth anything, right? Um, so that's what's happening internationally, right? Let's focus more on the domestics of the 20s. So we are a consumer economy. Here's tons of different things that we we're making. We got toasters. I love a good toaster, all right? Um, washing machines, refrigerators, all sorts of stuff going on. Um, and again, consumer economy, that means that the consumers are buying lots of things. We have a bunch of new products. The only problem with this is that sometimes we can't afford all these new products, so we're going to buy them with credit. So think of when everyone warns you about using credit cards is that if you don't pay off that credit card, things are going to get bad, right? If you can't pay, make your payments, they're going to take your items back. So um, just like today, um, some people will use this responsibly, some will not. And the people that don't use it responsibly are going to be quite a few. Um, so that's just going to kind of build up and build up until we finally get to the crash, right? We're going to look at some stuff with popular culture. All right. And again, this is just kind of a quick overview of what's going on. All right, we got silent movies, so we might have heard of Charlie Chaplin at the time. Our first movies with sound will become uh, available at this time period. Um, and our first movie with sound is called The Jazz Singer. Um, here is a poster for it. Um, unfortunately, this guy is going to be in blackface, so it is a bit racist, um, to say the least. Um, but most of the stuff from this time period that makes us want to focus on this national culture is that we're going to have the radio, right? So the radio is definitely something to write down, all right? That is a big ticket item. All right, and we're going to have new radio stations called NBC and CBS, which obviously now are TV channels. Um, because we're going to have this national way to communicate with everyone, we're going to see um, jazz music all around the country. Later, when we get to the Great Depression, um, we're going to see the ability for politicians to talk to everyone across the entire country at the same time. So definitely some positive things coming out of that. We're also going to see celebrity culture happening at this time period. So Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb for our baseball fans. All right, we got Jack Dempsey if you're into boxing. All right, Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart are going to be pilots during this time period. All right, so again, lots of stuff going on. We even got Gertrude Ederle over here as the first woman to swim across the English Channel. So again, this idea of having uh, national celebrities, we never had that sort of thing before. Right. Um, now with jazz, all right, again, we're just going to go over again some of the basics here, all right, is that jazz music is starting off in the New Orleans area, comes from African American culture, is going to become more and more popular, especially with the advent of that radio that we're going to have. Um, during this time period, uh, young women started cutting their hair uh, short, wearing shorter skirts, um, and dancing. And so they would be nicknamed flappers. Now, when they would be called flappers here, one of the stories I have heard from this is that they would be dancing so much that they would end up taking their shoes off. So think of like, you know, homecoming and prom. You always see everyone taking their shoes off because their shoes hurt. So they're going to be dancing all around. And then when they would leave these dance halls, then they would just put their boots back on, but not lace them up. And so their boots would kind of flap around, right? Um, so that's one of the stories I've heard of how they are going to be called the flappers. Um, we're going to have tons of music at the time. Tin Pan Alley is going to be a bunch of producers of jazz music. Louis Armstrong, all right, we should probably know of him. All right, he is a jazz trumpeter. He is going to be kind of like the ambassador of jazz for the rest of the country. Um, we got Duke Ellington's band down here. All right, Irving Berlin is this guy up here. He curates a lot of popular music at the time. Um, so definitely I'm going to put some links below for some jazz music, definitely some Irving Berlin because he uh, he's awesome and also Duke Ellington is awesome as well. All right, um, Duke Ellington and his band I think is probably when I think of jazz music, that's who I usually think of is Duke Ellington um, just because it sounds so awesome. Um, but I'll definitely put lots of links for you guys down below in the description. So definitely if you're working on something, have some of that jazz music in the background. It'll kind of help you out. All right. So to kind of add a little bit more to stuff going on with our flappers or our women of the 1920s, all right, is remember we got the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920. All right. Women are working outside of the home or women are going to college. All right. And again, we have these images of the flappers. Um, and again, any cl uh, clips that you might see or YouTube videos in my PowerPoint, I will definitely put those in the description below for you guys. Right. Okay, some other things happening culturally at this time period. We kind of mentioned at the beginning the lost generation, and this is going to be mostly a group of writers. So some of these writers you might be familiar with, so like F. Scott Fitzgerald, right, the author of The Great Gatsby, right, Ernest Hemingway, he wrote A Farewell to Arms, Gertrude Stein and T.S. Eliot are both poets, right. Again, this lost generation are people who are disillusioned from the First World War, right, and are 
expressing this disillusionment in their writings. So um, most of you guys have read The Great Gatsby, all right, because you've had to read that for English class. And again, think about the themes in that book. Um, the idea that you have all of this wonderful things that are happening at the beginning and all this excess, but then the end of the book is really this tragedy of the excess of what's going on and that this guy has this whole story how he wants to go find this person that he was thinking was the love of his life and then ends up in a tragedy right and so that's kind of what a lot of these people are experiencing this idea of dealing with tragedy um, another good book I would definitely recommend to you guys would be A Farewell to Arms right again it's about um, it's from Ernest Hemingway and it is about World War One and like these people finding each other right and you know it's kind of a love story but based in the war and but again it will end up in this bittersweet tragedy um that's happening so very similar to Gatsby's um the book the story of Gatsby in that way right um artists we got Frank Lloyd Wright so again our AP art history kids might have seen this before this is one of their images I believe right and this is one of his houses he's an architect um and it's called uh Falling Waters and so there is this house it is in in um, southern, it's close to Pittsburgh. I think it's in West Virginia. Um, it's West Virginia, Pennsylvania border. Um, but it is a house that has a waterfall that runs underneath the house, um, which is pretty darn cool. Um, and then Georgia O'Keeffe, she draws all these paintings of uh, flowers and wilderness and things like that. Um, and all of them, you can definitely see this very abstract thing going on. So very like a close up uh, photograph, if you will, of a flower um, is what she's going to see. All right. Some other things that are going on here, all right, is um, if we were in class, we would be doing different activities with lots of the people from the progressive era and from the 1920s. Um, but we obviously didn't have time to do that. So I'm going to have this little insert here about Margaret Sanger. All right. So Margaret Sanger is this woman right here. All right. She is going to be the creator of Planned Parenthood which is still around today, right? And this is going to be kind of a uh, extension off of that progressive era. So remember the progressive era, we have lots of people in extreme poverty, right? And people are in the progressives are trying to help them out. Um, however, with this is that through her experiences is she saw that there were lots of people that were having children that could not take care of their own children um, and that there would be families that their children would end up dying in infancy because they were not able to take care of them or there was children just running around all over the place. And so this idea of having every child a wanted child. Now, this is not a time period when we have medical birth control, right? That is not uh, invented until 1960. Um, however, this idea of planned parenthood, um, of when one should be having children and when one should not, right? Um, and so sometimes people think of her as a controversial figure because they associated this idea with things like abortion. Um, um, however, it was more of the idea that she wanted people to have those conversations and actually plan out if they wanted to have children, when and if and all those other things. Um, but again, very stigmatized topic at that time period because it's still a stigmatized topic today. Um, but again, trying to advocate for women to have a bit more of a choice in when or if they were having children. Um, and so to kind of give it... Um, a connection to the future on this one is that 1960 is when the birth control pill will be invented but even in 1960s um, that was illegal for even married couples to gain access to um, because again of these social stigmas that were at that time period and again even still today um, not as much as today but um, not as much during our current time period but still around All right um, some other social things that are happening here so we're going to talk about immigrants Okay, so we definitely have anti-immigrant stuff happening at this time period, right? And this, again, is mostly going to be that um, fear of communism, right? So Red Scare stuff is happening here, right? Now, what's unusual about this time period is that usually if the economy is doing well, which the economy in the 1920s is doing amazing, usually economy is doing well, we like immigrants, right? We want more and more people coming to the country so we can have more and more of those jobs being filled, right? And booming that economy more and more and more. This is a time period when the economy is doing well and we actually have less immigration happening, right? And so we have our National Origins Act. That is going to basically, if you're from a country that would have 
communism, so like Russia or Eastern European countries, you're not allowed here in the US. And then we're gonna have two different quota acts, right? Now a quota is just a limit of numbers. So it's going to limit how many people can come into the US at the particular time periods, right? We're gonna have the first election where um, presidential election when we have a Catholic who is running for president. Um, now think back to when we talked about immigration, there was a cartoon of uh, the Catholic popes, but they were alligators, right? If you guys remember that cartoon, um, that kind of tells you if that's from the Gilded Age time period that people were scared of Catholics taking over the country, if someone's running for president and they're Catholic, that would definitely um, cause some people some anxiety at that time. Even in 1960, when Kennedy ran for president, people thought the Catholic pope would take over the US. Um, yeah. People have some some issues here and there. Um, and then we also have this case, the Sacco and Vanzetti trial, right? So from their names, you can definitely tell they are Italian, right? Um, and they are going to be convicted of murder. Um, there was no real evidence that they um, did it at the time, but because they are immigrants, they were also anarchists at the time, so they didn't believe in organized government. Um, you're definitely going to have that influencing the trial. And again, just another example of people being against immigrants. So we're gonna look at two different cartoons here, right? This cartoon you guys have seen before, right? This idea that you have a funnel, right? All the people coming from Europe are gonna have a quota so that that way only 3% are allowed into the United States. So that's definitely a reference to the quota acts. Over here, this is supposed to be a European anarchist and they have a bomb and a gun and they're sneaking up behind Lady Liberty, right? So people were scared of anarchists and uh, communists and all of those people are usually gonna be found in labor unions, right? So we're gonna have a little backtrack and look at uh, A. Mitchell Palmer again. So the Palmer raids, those were during uh, World War One, and then go into the 1920s. So again, a fear of communists, they're going to be looking for them in those labor unions. This is also when we're gonna start seeing the um, this new person come into town, this J. Edgar Hoover, right? Who is going to be the creator of the FBI, right? Um, another good movie to reference for you guys is there is a movie called J. Edgar, um, Leonardo DiCaprio, plays him in that particular movie um, and they do a really good job of um, showing the creation of the FBI this um, struggle with anarchists and communists and things like that um, so again another good movie if you want to kind of add those movies to your list to help you kind of understand a little bit more of what that time period looked like um, the other thing in the 1920s is we have a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, right? So before um, they were around in the Reconstruction era, then we had the um, the different acts to try and, uh, by President Grant, to try and stop them from organizing. Now, it's not that they went away. Um, it's just that since there was no federal enforcement of Reconstruction anymore, they didn't have to hide, right? So now in the 20s, Right, we are going to have a resurgence of this particular organization. Um, and now, instead of just being anti-African Americans, they're going to be anti-everybody. So think of them as an equal opportunity hate group, if you will. So they're anti-black, anti-immigrant, anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic, anti-women, all right, anti-bootleggers. So those are people that are going to be um, smuggling alcohol during Prohibition, right? They're even going to create a new movie called A Birth of a Nation. You can find that on YouTube if you wish. Um, it's very unusual, um, but basically kind of gives a American history perspective, but is all controlled by the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so we're gonna see them coming around all over the place. Now, unfortunately, we are going to have um, some local history that goes along with this. So from um, other classes, you guys probably have heard of Leo Frank, right? Leo Frank is a Jewish man who was um, uh, he was accused of killing and raping a young girl that worked in his factory. This girl name was Mary Fagan, right? And um, he was found guilty of this. Um, nowadays, they have um, said like, no, this wasn't this wasn't the case. Um, there's other evidence that came up, came uh, came to light later. Um, but when he is um, convicted and put in jail, there's going to be a mob of people called the Knights of Mary Fagan. And those Knights of Mary Fagan are going to kidnap him and take him to Marietta, hometown news, um, to uh, kill him and lynch him because Mary Fagan was originally from uh, Marietta. Now this uh, marker here, um, that is this historical marker, can be found at the site. So let's look at Google Maps here to give you a reference. All right, we got 75 is right here 
and right over here is the big chicken, all right? Okay, so it's the big chicken on the corner, right? And so it is on the corner of these two streets is where that historical marker is. Um, now, with the Ku Klux Klan, after this event happened, all right, they are then going to get other groups together, um, like the Sons of the Confederacy and things like that, and they're going to go to Stone Mountain, and there will form the new Ku Klux Klan. Um, and so they're... A little bit of our local history unfortunately all right um in other topics uh one of the things that was your guys's assignment was to watch the video about the scopes monkey trial all right so i'm not going to spend a lot of time on this but basically it is a event where we are fighting back and forth on the topic of evolution um it should evolution be taught in schools or should creationism be taught in schools um this was a controversial topic at the time but it's also controversial today I want to point out a little picture right here. This was a sticker that was in the Cobb County uh, biology books from 2002, so not too terribly long ago, um, where they were basically saying that evolution is a theory and uh, should be considered um, equal to creationism. Um, it's not there anymore, thank goodness, but again, another bit of local history. All right, if you have taken AP Psychology, you talked about Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein. Um, these are two names you probably have heard of before just because they're so famous. But again, 1920s, we're having these new ways of thinking, right? Freud's now thinking about things with psychology. Obviously, a lot of his um, ideas are not um, given a lot of credit nowadays because of the different things that he did, including a lot of drug use that was going on. But he was looking into dreams um, to try and figure out why you did certain things. Um, again, most of that stuff is not given credit anymore, but... Um, again, people starting to think about new ways of thinking. Um, and then with Einstein, you obviously have the theory of relativity, um, new ways of thinking about the universe. Um, these things were talked about a little bit in that video as well, right? And our last topic here is going to be on prohibition. So prohibition is the 18th Amendment, right? Now, an amendment, if you break an amendment, it's, you can't go to jail, right? Because there's no thing that says, like, you break it and then this is your punishment. So you have to have a law enforcing it. So we definitely want to add the Volstead Act is going to be the federal law that says if you break prohibition you will go to jail right um now with this you have all sorts of things going on lots of good movies about all these types of things al capone is obviously the most famous um gangster of the 1920s um he is out of chicago um and then when the lake the great lakes would freeze over they would have these uh, cars that they would make them go really fast to go across the, the frozen lakes to bring that alcohol into chicago um down here in the south you would have a lot of people would soup up those cars um, and then be trying to outrun the police. And that's where stock car racing or NASCAR comes from. Um, so again, maybe a better part of uh, local history. Um, Al Capone is eventually caught um, for tax evasion um, and not actually for all the different things that he did that were illegal. Right? Um, the Untouchables is the group of people in the FBI that are trying to catch Al Capone. So that is another good movie. Kevin Costner stars in that one. That's a good movie about all the things happening with Al Capone if you are interested. Right. Um, remember that uh, with World War One was why we passed the Prohibition 18th Amendment. Um, and so we're going to be having that uh, happening because we want to allow more grains to be used for our soldiers. It will be repealed at the beginning of the Great Depression with the 21st Amendment. Easy way to remember that is 21 is the age of drink. So 21 is when America got to drink again as well. Um, and then all of these crime guys didn't just go away. A lot of them are going to leave and go to Las Vegas. Um, totally makes sense. Um, and then when you think of a bootlegger, a bootlegger, the actual term is that they would put liquor in their boot all right so here we have a little picture of this lady putting a bottle of liquor in her boot and so she is a boot legger all right um our last thing we want to talk about before we wrap up for today all right is our takeaways from the 20s what should we be thinking of big picture topics so what events or behaviors triggered the era of, ex of excess what behaviors of the 20s will lead to the 30s economic collapse and what other time periods could be similar to the 20s Okay, so take a pause real quick, see if you can answer those on your own before I give you the answers. All right, so when we're going over these, what behaviors um, triggered the era of excess? So basically World War One. all right? Again, that generation had to face all these horrors. They wanna live life to the fullest. They don't think about the consequences, right? Definitely something we could maybe relate to right now um, when we are obviously able to leave our houses and go out and do more normal things. We 
definitely want to kind of take things in stride. We want to think about consequences so we do not make other mistakes. Um, how, what behaviors of the 20s lead to the economic collapse? Overspending, overconsumption, right? So overconsumption of products, not paying attention to the warning signs of farmers, the stock market speculation. So we're going to be kind of like gambling in the stock market and borrowing lots of money that we don't have. Um, and what other time periods are related to the 20s? That is going to be the 1950s, all right, when we have another economic boom and people are buying lots of new products um, after, the, for, after the Second World War. Right. So guys, hopefully this helped you guys out. Um, again, read uh, those books. If you have not uh, watched the video on the Scopes trial, definitely would um, recommend you watch it. It's not very long as far as a video goes, um, or like a documentary video goes, but it does have a lot of really good things. Um, definitely make sure that if you have any questions, you send those to me and remind, and I will try to answer them the best that I can. All right. See you guys soon.